Welcome to Crime, Corruption, and Cocktails, the true crime podcast where we discuss cases that involve corruption and negligence from the people that we are expected to trust. These cases range from the police ignoring protocol to corporations placing people's lives in jeopardy in order to maximize profit. Today, I'm drinking a spiked hot chocolate because it's very cold and dark and sad outside. What about you, Del? So I'm actually having a virgin daiquiri with this case. Ooh, nice kind of tropical drink to go along with this Caribbean case. Absolutely. Let's get into it. Natalie Holloway was born on October 21st, 1986 to Beth and Dave Holloway in Memphis, Tennessee. She was the oldest of two children. Dave and Beth divorced in 1993 and Beth remarried in 2000. The family then moved to Mountain Brook, Alabama. Natalie was a member of the National Honor Society and an active member of her school's dance team. She graduated with honors from Mountain Brook High School in May of 2005. Natalie had a full ride scholarship to the University of Alabama and was planning on pursuing a career in medicine. On May 25, 2005, Natalie, along with 124 of her classmates, attended a five-day unofficial graduation trip to Aruba. The students were accompanied by seven chaperones that did a once-a-day check on them, but the chaperones stated they didn't keep very close eyes on the students, and this was very evident. The students frequently partied, got drunk, and switched rooms. It was so loud that the Holiday Inn told the group that they were not invited back. Natalie partied with the group and frequently started and ended her dates with heavy drinking. Natalie was last seen by her classmates leaving the Carlos's and Charlie's nightclub with Dutch Stu and Joran Randersloo and the Calfo brothers at 1.30 a.m. on May 30, 2005. She was scheduled to return home that day but did not meet the group at the predetermined meeting place. Her luggage and passport were still in her room and when the police searched the surrounding area and water, they could not find her. When Natalie missed her flight, Beth and her husband immediately flew to Aruba with a few friends. Beth started her own investigation and found out the names of Vander Sloot and gave his name to the police. Beth had learned of Vander Sloot's name from a clerk at the Holiday Inn that recognized him from a, a videotape. Beth and the Aruban police went to Vander Sloot's house. Vander Sloot told them that he dropped off Natalie at the hotel around 2 a.m. after going to the California Lighthouse to see sharks. Natalie fell but didn't want any help. They then saw a dark man in a dark shirt approached Natalie and they drove away. They said they thought the man was a security guard. This story was corroborated by the Peak Calpo. A massive search and rescue started almost immediately. Hundreds of American and Aruban volunteers searched and the Aruban government gave civil servants the day off in order to add manpower to the search. The Dutch Marines searched the seas and Aruban banks provided $20,000 worth of aid to volunteers. Beth was provided with a hotel, but they gave her Natalie's room. She then moved to the presidential suite of a nearby hotel. It is unclear whether the cameras at the Holiday Inn were working the night she disappeared, but the police commissioner stated that Natalie didn't have to go through the lobby to return to her hotel room. American law enforcement provided support to the Aruban police as well. There have been several witnesses that have come forward to provide evidence in this case. A local gardener stated that he saw Vandersloot and the Calpo brothers driving into the racket club around 2.30 a.m. and 3 a.m. on May 30th. Another jogger claims he saw the men burying a blonde-haired woman in a landfill in the afternoon of May 30th. The FBI used cadaver dogs to investigate both of these claims, but nothing was found. The three men that Natalie was seen leaving the nightclub with have always been the primary suspects. The police have arrested and released a number of suspects. Some have been arrested several times, but always released. There isn't a body or any other video evidence in this case, which unfortunately makes it harder to detain suspects. On June 5th, a Reuben police detained Nick John and Abraham Jones, former security guards from the nearby Allegro Hotel, on suspicion of murder and kidnapping. Reports also indicated that the two former guards were known for cruising hotels to pick up women, and at least one of them 
Adam had a prior incident with law enforcement. On June 9th, Vander Sloot and the Calpo brothers were arrested on suspicion of the kidnapping and murder of Natalie Holloway. After his initial release from police custody, Vander Sloot went on Fox News and gave a different story than what he told Beth and the police. He stated that Natalie wanted to have sex with him, but he refused because he didn't have protection. He then, at her request, left her on the beach because she wanted to stay out all night, but he had classes in the morning. He said he lied because he was ashamed that he left her and thought she would turn up soon. On June 22nd, a Reuben police detained Vandersloot's father, Paulus Vandersloot, for questioning. He was arrested that same day. The Cal Poe brothers were rearrested on August 26th, and on January 17th, a Reuben police searched for Holloway's body in sand dunes on the northwest coast of Aruba, as well as areas close by the Marriott Beach. On April 15, 2006, Jeffrey von Kronvort was arrested by Aruban authorities on suspicion of criminal offenses related to dealing in narcotics, which, according to the prosecutor, might have been related to the disappearance of Holloway. On April 16, 2007, combined Aruban-Dutch team began pursuing the investigation in Aruba. On May 17, another suspect, Guido Weaver, was detained in the Netherlands on suspicion of assisting in the abduction, battering, and killing of Holloway. At Aruba's request, the Netherlands took over the investigation. There is a $250,000 award for information leading to Natalie's corpse. So far, all physical evidence that has been tied to this case has been tested and then dismissed. Aruban investigators re-arrested Van der Sloot and the Calpo brothers on November 21st, 2007 on suspicion of involvement in manslaughter and causing serious bodily harm that resulted in the death of Holloway. On November 30th, a judge ordered the release of the Calpo brothers. Van der Sloot was then released without charge on December 7th due to lack of evidence implicating him, as well as the lack of evidence that Holloway died as a result of a violent crime. Another man claims to have seen Van der Sloot acting suspiciously. Jorian de Jong, who was 59 at the time, says that he saw the now convicted murderer Van der Sloot carrying Natalie's lifeless body into a building site and then returning empty-handed. De Jong claims he was lying in the weeds on the beach when he saw Van der Sloot follow Natalie into the partially completed Marriott Aruba Surf Club timeshares just yards from the Holiday Inn where she was staying. He said, quote, I saw that Urine was chasing Natalie into a small building under construction. In about five minutes, he came out with Natalie in his arms and slammed the body of Natalie on the floor. And then he made an opening in a crawl space. He then continued to tell Inside Edition, quote, I knew she was dead. Uh, Natalie's dad, Dave, said that when he first talked to DeJong, it was in 2008, and he thought his claims were far-fetched. Dave has said that DeJong had reason not to go to police in 2005 because it would have been easy to pin Natalie's disappearance on him because DeJong was also involved in some other crimes, including drug dealing. For his part, Van der Sloot has dismissed the Jong story. Through his lawyers, he said, quote, he told me he knows this guy. He's a crackhead. He's an effing liar, a compulsive liar. He's homeless and wants money to buy drugs. You know the mind of a crackhead. He'll do anything to get money, and that's all he wants. You wouldn't want to waste your time listening to him. On February 1st, 2008, the Dutch media reported that Vandersloot had confessed to Natalie's murder, but Vandersloot claims that he was just saying what he thought the person wanted to hear. Footage was provided of Vandersloot talking to a person on a hidden camera, and when they started talking about Natalie, Vandersloot said that Natalie began convulsing, shaking, and he tried to revive her, but it didn't work. He stated he then called a friend who helped him dispose of her body. That same day, the Aruba Prosecutor's Office announced the reopening of the case. The Aruban Prosecutor's Office attempted to obtain an arrest warrant for Vandersloot based on the tapes. However, a judge denied the request. On November 24th, Fox News aired an interview with Vandersloot in which he alleged that he sold Holloway into sexual slavery, receiving money both when Holloway was taken and later on to be kept quiet. Vandersloot also alleged that his father paid off two police officers who had learned that Holloway was taken to Venezuela. Vandersloot later retracted the statements made in the 
the interview. On February 23rd, 2010, it was reported that Vandersloot had stated in an interview with the RTL group that he disposed of Natalie's body in a marsh in Aruba. Vandersloot then tried to extort Natalie's family. On March 29th, 2010, Vandersloot contacted John Kelly and said he would reveal the location of Holloway's body and the circumstances surrounding her death if he were given an advance of $25,000 against a total of $250,000. John Kelly is Beth's legal representative, and Kelly told the FBI who instructed him to complete the transaction. On May 10th, Vandersloot received a $15,000 wire transfer and was videotaped receiving $10,000 in cash in Aruba. He then provided false information on where Natalie's body was located. On June 3rd, he was charged in the U.S. District of Northern Alabama with wire fraud and extortion. U.S. Attorney Joyce Vance obtained an arrest warrant and submitted it to Interpol. On May 30th, 2010, which was five years to the day of Natalie's disappearance, Stephanie Ramirez went missing in Lima, Peru. She was found dead in Vandersloot's hotel room three days later. On June 3rd, Peru charged Vandersloot with murder and he was extradited to Peru the same day. On June 7th, Peruvian authorities said that Vandersloot confessed to killing Ramirez after he lost his temper because she accessed his laptop without permission and found information linking him to Holloway. In September of 2010, Vandersloot confessed to the extortion attempt stating it was for revenge for what Natalie's family had done to him over the past five years. On January 11th, 2012, Vandersloot pled guilty to the murder of Stephanie Ramirez and was sentenced to 28 years in prison. Peru has agreed to extradite Joran Vandersloot to the United States, but only after he finishes serving a 28-year murder sentence. The Peruvian news agency Andina reported, the Peruvian court system sentenced him in 2012, but he will be eligible for release in 2038 because of the time he already has spent in custody. In 2017, an Oxygen documentary series did an investigation into a new witness. A man named Gabriel came forward saying his roommate, John Ludwig, claimed that Vandersloot told him how he killed Natalie and even asked him to help hide her remains. Ludwig led the team to human remains, but they were determined not to be Natalie's. And Ludwig was actually stabbed to death while trying to kidnap a woman in Florida in 2018. Holloway's body has never been found, and she was declared legally dead in 2012. This was after a legal fight from Beth, who didn't want to do it. There are several theories about what happened to Natalie Holloway. Please note that these theories are speculation and we may never know what happened to her. The first theory is the most popular and that is that Euron Randerslew and the Kalpo brothers killed Natalie around 2 a.m. on May 30th. They then disposed of her body and decided on a cover-up story. Many, including Natalie's mom, Beth Tweedy, speculated that they murdered her after a sexual assault. The next theory is that Natalie died accidentally due to an overdose while with the boys and they got scared and buried her body. This theory is slightly plausible, but without a body, there is no evidence. Some have claimed that Natalie was sold into sex slavery, but there is no evidence to support this. So Jenny, what do you think happened to Natalie? I would honestly be shocked if Yoron was not involved. And I do believe that Natalie is unfortunately dead and he is responsible for this, whether or not her death was intentional. He's changed his story so many times and he never paints himself in a good picture, honestly. And I mean, if he's going to go as far on camera to say that, yeah, his dad helped him hide it and they paid police officers, who is this person? He really seems to get off on the attention that he gets and this whole villain identity that he's created for himself as well as the media. I can kind of see this whole situation going in a few different ways. I can see Yoren drugging Natalie, like he had mentioned, possibly with the hope of sexually assaulting her and Natalie having some type of reaction to the drug. And she either died or passed out from that and he freaked out and then just buried her or kind of finished her off when she really wasn't dead. Maybe she had some type of alcohol poisoning and then he got freaked out too. Who knows? Um, But Yorin has proven to be violent, so I can see him maybe strangling her if she refused to have sex with him or just generally being violent if he was rejected somehow. 
Regardless, I think his father helped him dispose of her body and definitely helped cover up for his actions. I can't really say much about the Calpo brothers, if they were involved, whether they sexually assaulted Natalie, whether they were accomplices, whether they just maybe dropped her and you're on off. But I think they definitely know more information than they're letting on. And honestly, I think I do kind of believe DeJong's story. He's come forward multiple times and he even at one point admitted he was doing something illegal at the construction site when he saw Vandersloot. Why implicate yourself like that for no reason if you really didn't see anything? Natalie's father said that this is the strongest lead he had gotten at a certain point, and I really don't understand why the Aruban police won't check under the hotel. From what her father said, it sounds like it would be easy. They wouldn't need to demolish anything. They would just need to like drill four holes in the ground. I'm sure it's not as easy as that, but I mean, if there's no demolition, I can't really see that causing like a ton of issue or disruption at this hotel. But this is just kind of more evidence that leads to me believing that the police definitely mishandled the case and are maybe even hiding something. But what about you, Del? What are your thoughts? So I believe that Vandersloot kidnapped Rachel the murder Natalie Holloway. I believe he killed Holloway in a similar fashion to the way he killed Ramirez five years later. While there's not much in the way of physical evidence, his history suggests that he is a violent person with no respect for women. He constantly changes his story and then tries to extort Natalie's mom for money by dangling Natalie's corpse whereabouts. I am not sure of the level of involvement of the Calpo brothers, but at the very least, they are covering up for Randersloot. So before we get into the discussion, the unsung hero in this case is Dave Holloway. He has tirelessly fought for justice and to find out what happened to Natalie. He has done this without being problematic and without diminishing the work of the local law enforcement officers. So now let's jump into some of the unique elements in this case. The first is the criticism of Natalie's mom, Beth, and stepfather, George. Beth has been accused of using her power and status to influence this case. She has repeatedly interfered in the investigation in order to prevent information about Natalie's activities in Aruba becoming publicized. She even went as far as telling Natalie's classmates to not talk to the police and the media about Natalie. And to top it all off, she then got mad at the media for switching their attention from Natalie's case to Hurricane Katrina. I had no idea that this happened. I honestly had never really heard of her, I guess, problematic actions before and maybe that's just based off the American media I'm consuming around Natalie Holloway's case but it was a hurricane I for those who lived in the U.S. at the time it was terrible and it deserved as much media coverage Hurricane Katrina as it got how many people died how many people were displaced it took the city of New Orleans years to recover And some areas are still just kind of getting back on their feet now. So to say your daughter is worth more than that entire city is offensive, in my opinion. So just to put it in perspective, over 1,800 people died as a result of Hurricane Katrina. And over $125 billion in damage happened. So, you know, while I think that her going missing is sad and it's awful and I wish it hadn't happened, to say that her singular case should get more media coverage than a Category 5 hurricane hitting a major city, I think that's just asinine. To play devil's advocate for Beth, she saw the media as her biggest tool to help her daughter. And remember, with the Johnny Gosh case, we said that the parents needed to put pressure on the police through the media because the police weren't doing anything to help them and they knew the media would be the best chance. And we also have to remember too, Beth is a woman who has lost her daughter. It's every parent's worst nightmare. And her daughter was just about to start her life. So I'm sure that kind of hit even harder for her too. There's very few people that can relate to what Beth was going through. And maybe as problematic as she was, I'm sure she was desperate. And, you know, we can't say what we would do if we were in her shoes. And that's true. But I think that it really relies on, in that situation, what are the best practices? And I think her being so aggressive and honestly being really entitled 
didn't help Natalie's case. I definitely do see the entitlement. Um, I know that the country of Aruba, from what I have seen, were really supportive of their police and that they were angry that Beth had called the Calpo brothers criminals since they had not been charged with anything, which I do understand. I understand both sides, Beth feeling like they were criminals in the country, not thinking that way, especially if they weren't charged. And I'm sure too, they thought that Beth was probably some loud American coming in, a tourist taking up the space, like Americans notoriously always do. Right. And she even tried to start a boycott of Aruba. It failed to gain widespread support, but the then governor of Alabama was supporting it. And keep in mind that Aruba is a tourist country and its economy really heavily relies on it. So the fact that she was attacking a lot of people's livelihoods probably didn't sit well either. That's a good point. And in all honesty, I feel like she probably didn't need to start a boycott. I'm sure a lot of people heard this case and didn't feel safe going anyway. So I find it so weird that Natalie's mom, Beth, wanted to boycott Aruba. It makes me think like, why would she allow her daughter to go there in the first place? It is very bizarre to me. Honestly, I thought this was like an official school trip, considering how many people went. Who has an unofficial school trip with over 100 people? And seven chaperones? Are you kidding me? My senior trip, this obviously was an official school trip, but my senior trip definitely had like 10 people and there were probably less than 100 of us on the trip. It's so wild to me that people would let their kids just go to a foreign country like that. And obviously these kids were just like partying nonstop. Like we said, I'm sure there was lots of sex, lots of alcohol, all that craziness and that all of that just doesn't mix for these young people that are dumb and vulnerable, even more vulnerable because they're not in their right state of mind. Right. It seems like the chaperones were chaperones in name only. If you're someone's chaperone, how are you only checking in once a day? Yeah. You are responsible for the safety of over 120 students. And your solution was, oh, I'm just going to check on them once a day. They'll be fine. To the point where the Holiday Inn said that they would not allow the group to come back. Yeah, and I understand. I mean, like, they're not just traveling across the country. They're traveling to another country. You don't know what's going on there. I know 2005 was a different time. Maybe people couldn't, like, readily search the internet to see what was going on in Aruba. I don't know what the crime rates are like there or what they were like there, but something is very bizarre to me. I know my school had, like, trips to Europe, and obviously, you know, if you're of age, you can drink in Europe there earlier than you can in America, but... This just seems so reckless. That's absolutely true. And that brings us to our next thing that this case shines a light on, and that's tourist safety. So in 2019, there was approximately 37.79 million U.S. citizens who travel overseas. Traveling abroad invites a host of dangers, including becoming the victim of a violent crime. And while there are some supports available, the U.S. State Department routinely discourages U.S. citizens from visiting certain places. They even have an international travel advisory online, and whether they recommend or discourage U.S. citizens from visiting, certain countries depends on what's going on. Some of the more recent cases of Americans being killed or harmed overseas are Tammy Lawrence Daly. She was on vacation in the Dominican Republic and she claims that she was taken into a maintenance room and beaten for hours at the hotel by an unknown man wearing a uniform. She had left her room at night to get a snack and she was just attacked. And the pictures of her are so brutal. It's really scary to see and to know she was beaten for hours for seemingly no reason. The hotel is weary of Tammy's story and they claim that she went public with the story after she attempted to seek $2.2 million in compensation, which I mean, I kind of can't blame her for if you're not really getting compensated, I would go, I mean, I probably would have gone public as soon as it happened, but I would go public. I mean, she has these, she clearly didn't beat herself up, but you have to see these pictures. Yeah, and it's always a double-edged sword with victims, right? Are you less of a victim because you're seeking compensation? Of course not. So the fact that the hotel would even bring that up looks like they're trying to find a scapegoat. 
Yeah, good point. And then there's also Carla Stefaniak, and she was killed by her Airbnb security guard in Costa Rica, and he was sentenced to 16 years in prison. And I actually remember hearing about this on the news watching Good Morning America when she first went missing, and then they did find her body, unfortunately, not long after. So in addition to the extremely violent crimes that take place, people who are traveling also become an easy target for things like pickpocketers because they're super vulnerable. Pickpocketers in Europe and Nepal makes it especially dangerous for international travelers and backpackers. And that's something that can happen in any city too, really. I know um, if anyone has seen, what's that movie, Now You See Me with the Magicians, there are people that kind of do like little shows on the sidewalk and then they have someone else come and like pick your pocket. So that happens anywhere. You really just need to be safe. Like Dell said, the economy of many of these countries, Aruba included, rely heavily on tourism and they want to keep up appearances and make sure that people feel safe and want to travel there. In Natalie's case, this could be another reason why a potential police government cover-up may have taken place. And everything we're saying, all these safety tips, it doesn't mean you shouldn't travel and see the world because it has so much to offer and you really, you can enrich yourself traveling anywhere. But you do need to be cautious just like you would in your own country. So when thinking about safety, it's important to talk about safety and numbers and the roles strangers can play in maintaining a safe environment, especially for those who are vulnerable. I know there's a lot of true crime listeners that are women out there, and there's definitely kind of an unwritten rule between women and how we protect one another when we're out. At bars, always make sure you know where your friends are, if they're in the bathroom, who they're leaving with, you watch their drinks while you're gone, and just be cautious of who you're kind of around. It's unfortunate that this is the reality, but we need to be safe rather than sorry. We talk about drinking on the show, but we always want people to drink responsibly, so please keep that in mind. This is no different from when you're traveling. When traveling, always let people know where you plan to be, what you plan to do, and how often you'll communicate with them and how you'll communicate with them. Traveling alone can be very dangerous as well, so especially do that letting people know where you are if you are traveling alone. And get emergency numbers for whatever country you're traveling to. And saying all of this, we're by no means blaming Natalie's friends. We know that they were drunk and they were young at the time, but we can be the best protection for our friends. Absolutely. And this reminds me of the Kanika Jenkins case in Chicago. She was partying uh, in a hotel with her friends and somehow at the end of the night, she ended up dead in the freezer in the hotel. And her friends seemingly didn't know that she left. and. They had her stuff, but they weren't worried. It took her mother pleading with the hotel just to be able to find her body. So like you said, we're not blaming the friends, though in the Kanika Jenkins case, it is definitely suspect. We're just saying that please know where your friends are. If you're going out with someone, you should absolutely know where everyone in your party is at all times. Not to be, uh, you know, big brother surveillance looking over them. But if you're going out with someone, I think that it's a mutual responsibility on everyone's part to make sure that people are staying safe. I definitely agree. And I'm very big on safety. I'm the person that if I see a girl at a bar and she looks a little uncomfortable, I'll say, are you okay? I'm not afraid to do that. Um, And one time I wanted to share this just to give everyone some perspective, and maybe this will encourage you if you're ever in a position to stand up for your friend. But in college, I had a friend, we were all drinking, we were at a party, and she went back to this guy's dorm room. And I knew she was drunk, and I knew he was drunk. And I just felt uncomfortable about the situation. And I tried to tell my friend, like, are you sure? Are you sure? She was getting kind of mad at me. And I did get, you know, like a little nervous. And I kind of stepped back from that. I'm not a very confrontational person. But I told one of her other friends, like, hey, she just went off with this guy. And our friend was like, oh my God, we have to stop her. (laughs) So we remembered the dorm that this kid lived in. We ran over to the dorm and there were these two girls there. And we were like, can you guys let us into the building? Our friend is in there and we're worried about her. And then we told the security guard and we went up to the guy's room and we pulled her out of the room. And it was like such a crazy night, but she thanked me later. She thanked us because she said, if it wasn't for you guys, like, I don't really know what would have happened that night. So please take that going forward. 
don't be afraid to look crazy. Maybe your friend will be mad at you, but would you rather have a friend that's a little upset or a dead friend or traumatized friend? That is absolutely true. And, you know, we talk about this in the context of friends, but strangers can also be the best person to have your back when you're going out. We talked in the last case about the connection that you have with people when you're in a common space, enjoying a common thing. So that protective factor also comes into play when you're going out to concerts and you're going by yourself. Hey, just, you know, look over your shoulder, make sure everything around you is okay. You know, it, it never hurts to be an extra eye watching someone's back, even if you don't know them. Definitely. And some people say that this is kind of victim blaming because the emphasis is on a woman protecting herself. But like we said a few minutes ago, this is the unfortunate reality. In a perfect world, we wouldn't have to be doing this. In a perfect world, offenders would be held responsible. They wouldn't be doing these violent things, but that's not the world we live in. No, it's not. And I think that it is foolish for people to say, well, just hope and pray that someone else is going to do better and just live your life in lolly da and act like nothing bad is ever going to happen to you. I think that is definitely a foolish way to look at things. You can always be your best advocate and your best protector and be your friend's best advocate and their best protector. As with many of the high-profile cases that we've covered, there is a certain level of media bias that comes into play. This case was widely reported on, and many felt that this level of media attention was connected to Natalie's appearance and the fact that she disappeared in a dream getaway destination. Lacey Peterson and Chandra Levy were also young white women who went missing around a similar time as Natalie. They were both found murdered, unfortunately. And Elizabeth Smart, she was a young girl who was abducted, raped, and thankfully brought back to her family alive. But again, all three young, attractive white women. And this phenomena has been dubbed missing white woman syndrome by Gwen Eiffel of PBS. And this term just refers to the amount of media coverage missing white women get compared to white men and people of color. And Anderson Cooper and Ariana Huffington, both kind of American media personalities, I guess you'd say, even criticized the amount of attention Natalie's case got. Missing white woman syndrome is problematic because it paints white women as victims that need to be protected, and it takes their pain and suffering more seriously than that of women of color. Sometimes women of color are often seen as people that can really protect themselves and fend for themselves, and historically, black women, I know people didn't think that they felt pain the same way as white people did. This bias within the media unintentionally tells viewers who we should and shouldn't care about and what we should take seriously. And one case I wanted to point out is that of Sage Smith. She was a 19-year-old transgender woman of color who went missing from Charlottesville, Virginia in 2012. And she received very little media coverage. It kind of took a while for the police to take her case seriously, but thankfully her family got to them, but they still can't get the media on their side. I've seen a lot of YouTubers cover her case, but just Googling her, you really don't get that much. You don't get anything from like an official news site either, which is very sad. And like we've been saying, we said this in the Johnny Gosh case, the media really can help you out and they can put pressure on people, on the police. Some other factors can play a role in media coverage. In 2004, for example, 11-year-old Carly Brucia was abducted in Florida, and the entire abduction was caught on surveillance camera. And because of this hard evidence and footage, media could report easier. And unfortunately, it's more exciting news that people want to see. It, it's, you can visualize it. You can maybe sympathize with her family more. And a very recent case of this was the George Floyd murder, where I don't think that his case would have gotten as much attention as it did if it wasn't for the fact that it was on film. Yeah, and that's kind of like a whole other can of worms, how we need footage as proof that this terrible thing happened to you. Before we wrap this up, Del, do you think Natalie will ever be found? 
You know, unfortunately, at this point, it's been about 15 years. I have little faith that her body is actually going to be found. I'm hoping that one day Vandersloot confesses to what actually happened to her. So even if we don't have the body, we know what was her final fate. Um, How about you? For some reason, I kind of do think I can see this getting maybe not solved, but I think we could be able to find her and hopefully give her family closure. Like we said, we do think she's deceased, unfortunately, but I don't know. I kind of feel like someone might cave, someone connected somehow might cave and tell us something. And maybe if DeJong is right, maybe someone will take his claim seriously and will look under that hotel. I, I hope so. As much as we're saying, you know, the media coverage is kind of crazy and her mom maybe didn't handle things right, it it is very sad. I mean, none of what we're saying takes away from the tragedy that a young person was killed. And I definitely agree. This case is really sad because you think of all the potential that was just beaming out of her. If you have any information concerning the Natalie Holloway case, you can contact your local FBI office. That wraps up this week's case. Thank you for listening. Please let us know in the comments what you think about Natalie Holloway's case and tell us your theories. Make sure you click the subscribe button and leave a five-star review. You can find us on your favorite podcast platform and YouTube every Wednesday with a new episode. Follow us on Instagram at Crime Corruption Cocktails and on Twitter at Charade Inc. Please consider donating to our Patreon. This will help us get better equipment and bring higher quality content to you. We appreciate any amount you can give. This is Jenny and Dell signing off. Stay safe. Thank you.